The final voyage of HMS Terror has long puzzled scholars. The battleship's checkered history and mysterious demise have served as a subject of controversy for nearly 200 years. Now, however, new evidence has emerged to finally shed light on what really happened to Terror and all the souls on board, and the truth is grislier than what anyone ever imagined. Perfectly preserved shipwreck reveals the unsettling fate of its crew. Perfectly preserved shipwreck reveals the unsettling fate of its crew. Constructed in 1813, the Terror was a British naval ship that specialized in destruction. Armed with two heavy mortars and ten cannons, the bombing vessel was jam-packed with all kinds of firepower that truly gave meaning to its name. The Terror played a key role in the War of 1812, taking part in the bombardment of Stonington, Connecticut, in 1814. A year later, the ship provided support during the Battle of Fort Peter, as well as the attack on St. Mary's, Georgia. After the war, the Terror was decommissioned until 1828 when it was called to serve in the Mediterranean. The vessel suffered damage near Lisbon, Portugal, shortly after beginning its patrol, and was removed from service thereafter. But the Terror found new life in the mid-1830s when it was recommissioned as a polar exploration vessel. With its sturdy frame and powerful engine, the Terror seemed capable of traversing even the most treacherous of Arctic terrains. This confidence was put to the test in 1836, when Captain George Back helmed the Terror on an expedition to Hudson Bay. Despite being well equipped for the journey, the vessel wound up trapped in sea ice for 10 months before returning to port. The Terror's second expedition in 1840 under James Clark Ross proved more fruitful, as the ship and its companion vessel, the HMS Airbus, completed a three-year journey to Antarctica. Mount Terror, a dormant volcano on Ross Island, was even named in the ship's honor. In May 1845, Sir John Franklin led the Terror and the Airbus on an expedition across the Northwest Passage, a feat that had never been accomplished before. The journey looked promising at the start, though after being spotted in Baffin Bay in August, the ships vanished without a trace. A series of search efforts were launched to locate the missing ships, though neither the vessels nor Franklin and his crew were ever found. Then, in 1859, a note was discovered in a stack of rocks on King William Island that revealed the startling fate of the expedition. Dated April 1848, the note explained that both the Terror and the Airbus had become trapped in ice in the Victoria Strait, forcing the crews to abandon ship. The survivors attempted to trek to a fur trading post some 600 miles away, though quickly perished from starvation and exposure. More than 100 years after the note's discovery, the remains of a number of crewmen were located on King William Island. Autopsies of the bodies showed that, in addition to hypothermia and lack of food, the men also suffered from lead poisoning and botulism, likely a result of tainted rations. In the late 20th century, Inuit researchers discovered that cannibalism may have played a role in the demise of the Terror and Airbus crews. Cut marks on the skeletal remains of several crew members suggested that the men may have resorted to eating one another to survive. Yet one question remained where were the ships? And for that matter, could they even be salvaged? After spending more than a century beneath the frigid waters of the Arctic, there was no telling what condition they'd be in if found. The answer to that question came two decades later, when wreck of the Airbus was discovered off the coast of King William Island in 2014. Then, in 2016, the Terror was located 45 miles away in a body of water aptly called Terror Bay. Archaeologists were eager to explore the lost wrecks, though it wasn't until 2019 that they acquired the technology to do so. Using a remotely operated vehicle, RAV, the researchers began a systematic exploration of the ships. Searching the various cabins and compartments of the vessels, the archaeologists were blown away by how well-preserved everything was. Cabinets were closed and filled with liquor, furniture sat in place, and even paper maps remained taut and readable. The impression we witnessed when exploring the HMS Terror is of a ship only recently deserted by its crew, seemingly forgotten by the passage of time, said RAV pilot Ryan Harris. The captain's cabin proved to be the biggest treasure trove, containing maps, a tripod, and several thermometers. Cabinets filled with plates and cutlery were also discovered, their contents still polished and colorful despite spending decades beneath the sea. 
But how was this possible? According to the researchers, the Arctic conditions created the perfect environment for preservation. Between the zero-degree water temperature, lack of natural light, and sedimentation, the artifacts had very little chance to decompose. This exploration marks the first many in an effort to recover all artifacts from the wreckages. By analyzing these objects, researchers hope to learn more about how and why Franklin's expedition met its tragic end. The excellent condition of the ship will, I hope, mean that there will soon be answers to so many questions about the fate of the Franklin expedition, shrouded in mystery since 1845, said British High Commissioner to Canada Susan Lejeune Dalajershek. With the terror mystery coming to a close, experts are wondering if their findings could shed some light on another puzzling nautical disappearance. Nobody knows exactly how many people were on board the MV Doña Paz when it left late in the Philippines in December 1987. But it soon became clear that it was dangerously crowded on the decks of the 24-year-old vessel. And when it collided with the MV Vector in the perilous Tablas Strait, the outcome was brutal and swift. Today, it's believed that more than 4,000 people died when the Doña Paz caught fire and sank swiftly to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. And if these figures are correct, that makes it the deadliest maritime disaster to ever occur during peacetime. But what happened on board this ill-fated vessel? And how did the incident claim so many lives? Like the sinking of the Titanic, which went down 75 years before the Doña Paz, this was a tragedy waiting to happen. And as the dust settled, tales of incompetence and human error made the disaster even harder to bear. Now, we look back on a shipwreck that horrified the world. Built in Hiroshima, Japan, in 1963, the Doña Paz first sailed under the name Himeuri Meru. At just over 300 feet long, it had capacity for just 600 people during this stage of its career. But 12 years into its service it was sold to the Filipino shipping operator Sulpicio Lines and tasked with ferrying passengers between the southern city of Cebu and the country's capital, Manila. Now renamed the Don Sulpicio, the vessel became one of the line's flagship vessels, plying the 300-mile route before being ravaged by fire in June 1979. Thankfully, every one of the 1,164 passengers on board were rescued from the inferno, but the ferry itself was not so lucky. And in the end, Sulpicio Lines declared it a constructive total loss in other words, an insurance write-off. This wasn't, though, the end for the ship that would become the Doña Paz. After writing off the vessel, Sulpicio Lines repurchased it and set about giving it a new lease of life. Eventually, it was relaunched with a brand new name and updated specs, now licensed to carry a maximum of 1,518 passengers. By this time, though, another ship had been promoted to the role of flagship by Sulpicio Lines. And so, the Doña Paz was demoted, assigned to an alternative route. Again starting in Manila, it now traveled to Tacloban via Catbalagan, also a total distance of some 300 miles. From its launch onwards, the Doña Paz sailed this familiar route two times every week, carrying passengers between the bustling capital and its counterpart in the south. But less than a decade after the devastating fire, the vessel would experience another brush with disaster. And this time, the people on board would not be so lucky. Today, the most notorious shipwreck in the world is probably the Titanic, the infamously ill-fated liner that struck an iceberg and sank with the loss of about 1,500 lives. But the fate of the Doña Paz was far more deadly, resulting in almost three times as many tragedies. So why has one become enshrined in legend, while the other has been almost lost to time? Well, for starters the Doña Paz, unlike the Titanic, was not packed with members of high society when it set out on its fateful voyage. Instead, it was carrying a complement of ordinary passengers from Tacloban to Manila, many of whom were traveling to meet up with family members in the city. After all, when the Doña Paz left Tacloban in the early morning of December 20, 1987, Christmas was just five short days away. According to reports, the vessel was due to arrive in Manila at 4 a.m. on the 21st, leaving plenty of time to prepare for the season's festivities. But tragically, most of the passengers would never make it to the city alive. In the Philippines, an estimated 80% of the population is Catholic, meaning that Christmas is a big deal. 
as a result, there were plenty of people desperate to make the trip to Manila on the Doña Paz that day. And even though the official capacity of the vessel was just over 1,500, far more than that piled on board at Tacloban. According to the official passenger manifest, there were 1,493 passengers on board the Doña Paz when it departed, along with 50 crew. But later estimates put that figure far higher, with some claiming that there were more than 4,300 people crammed onto the vessel. In an interview with news agency United Press International, one official claimed that illegal ticket sales had been common, bolstering the numbers to unmanageable levels. Whatever the actual number of people on board, it seems clear that the Doña Paz was crowded. Speaking to the New York Times newspaper two days after the tragedy, survivors recalled seeing passengers lying down to sleep in hallways and out on the open deck. In places, they claimed, people were sharing a single bed with as many as three others. Despite the cramped conditions, though, most of the passengers had settled down to sleep by 10 p.m. as the Doña Paz passed through the Tablas Strait. Around the same time, the oil tanker MT Vector was traveling from Bataan in the main island's Luzon province to the Isle of Masbate in the south. At a spot some 100 miles south of Manila, the two vessels collided. Laden with more than 1,000 tons of gasoline, the vector soon caught fire. And before long, the inferno had spread to the Doña Paz. Even in normal circumstances, the flames would have spelled disaster, but as it was, the passengers on the overloaded ferry didn't stand a chance. Speaking to the New York Times the day after the incident, survivor Paquito Osable explained that an explosion had alerted him to the disaster. He said, I went to a window to see what happened, and I saw the sea in flames. And I shouted to my companions to get ready, there is fire. The fire spread rapidly and there were flames everywhere. People were screaming and jumping Osable continued. The smoke was terrible. We couldn't see each other and it was dark. I could see flames, but I jumped. And he wasn't alone. As the fire tore through the Doña Paz, passengers tried to escape by desperately flinging themselves into the ocean below. In the end, the flames made short work of the 2,200-ton Doña Paz. Just two hours after the collision, it had disappeared beneath the waves. Another two hours later, it was joined by the vector. Today, both wrecks lie some 1,600 feet beneath the Pacific Ocean a haunting reminder of one of the worst disasters to ever play out at sea. But what happened after the Doña Paz sank? According to reports, many who made it off the ship perished in the water, where the leaking oil had caused the surface of the sea to burn. Meanwhile, those who survived found themselves navigating horrific scenes while clinging to suitcases in a bid to stay afloat. And the fire wasn't the only horror waiting for those who managed to make it into the water. According to Global Shark Attack File, which tracks interactions between humans and sharks, there were multiple encounters with the predators as survivors thrashed around in the Tablas Strait. And sadly, none of those victims lived to tell the tale. Luckily, the sinking of the Doña Paz had not gone unnoticed. According to reports, the captain and crew of another vessel, the MV Don Claudio, spotted the explosion as it tore through the night sky. Sadly, though, they arrived too late to help the majority of people on board the doomed ferry. Reaching the Doña Paz approximately one hour after the collision, the Don Claudio could do little more than pluck the few remaining survivors out of the water. Apparently, officers on board the rescue vessel threw nets and life preservers into the sea, giving them something to cling to, as they were slowly hoisted to safety. Later, the New York Times reported on December 22, a second would-be rescue ship, the Don Eusebio, also joined the search. But despite circling the wreck site for seven hours, its crew could see no sign of either the Doña Paz or its passengers. As local Coast Guard René M. Luspo remarked at the time, finding no debris is ominous. Also speaking to the New York Times, American Cliff Davies, who surveyed the site from a helicopter, agreed that the rescue operation did not bode well. He said, we covered about 100 miles of sea area, and except for maybe a piece of driftwood or two, we saw absolutely nothing as far as a shipwreck, oil spill, signs of life or signs of an accident. In the end, only 27 people were rescued alive from the wrecks of the two doomed vessels. 
Of these, according to reports, 25 were passengers on the ferry, while two had been working on the vector at the time of the collision. And although we may never know exactly how many people were on board that day, it's likely that the death toll was well in excess of 4,000. Some 75 years earlier, the world had mourned the sinking of the Titanic and the loss of 1,500 people in the middle of the North Atlantic. Now, many were left to wonder how an even deadlier maritime disaster could have happened again, this time within 100 miles of land. As the days passed, tragic stories from survivors and eyewitnesses began to emerge. Speaking to the New York Times, 34-year-old Pampilo Eulalia described the moments directly after the explosion. He said, I was still shaken by the noise when I saw my father-in-law jump into the sea. According to the paper, the fisherman soon followed suit, leaving his young daughter and niece behind. Swimming away from the burning Doña Paz, Culalia looked back and realized what was happening. He added, I saw the ship in flames and I wanted to kill myself. But God shook me and woke me. Eventually, he was rescued when someone threw a life preserver from the deck of the Don Claudio. Among the horrific accounts were testimonies that hinted towards a tragedy that could have been avoided. After the sinking of the Titanic, it was revealed that there had only been enough lifeboats for a fraction of those on board. And on the Doña Paz, it seemed, similar human errors had also contributed to an inflated death toll. According to reports, one survivor, Lothgardo Nieto of the Philippine Constabulary, claimed that there had been no life jackets available to those on board the Doña Paz. What's more, he added that the crew had done little to maintain order after the collision, instead, they had been gripped by the same sense of panic that had coursed through passengers. Apparently, Nieto also stated that the lights of the Doña Paz had extinguished within minutes, leaving no illumination to help the passengers evacuate the ship. As the dust settled, the Philippine Coast Guard launched an official investigation into the sinking. And before long, an even more horrific picture had emerged. According to the New York Times, the investigation found that many of the Doña Paz's crew had been away from their posts drinking beer when the incident occurred. In fact, one statement claimed that just a single man had been stationed on the bridge that night. An apprentice with limited skills. But at the time of the sinking, officials from Sulpicio Lines had laid the blame on poor visibility and the difficulties of maneuvering through the Tablas Strait. So what had really happened on board the Doña Paz? While officials worked to get to the bottom of the tragedy, the people of the Philippines began to mourn one of the worst disasters to ever happen at sea. On December 22, the then president of the Philippines Corazon Aquino released an official statement referring to the sinking as a national tragedy of harrowing proportion. She added, Our sadness is all the more painful because the tragedy struck with the approach of Christmas. Around the same time, there were reports that a four-year-old survivor had been found floating on a piece of timber, although this has never been confirmed. Within days of the sinking, Sulpicio Lines announced that it would be awarding the equivalent of about $550 today and compensation to the survivors. But before long protests broke out in Manila, demanding that the company also paid out for the unrecognized victims of the disaster. After all, thousands were missing from the official manifest, but their families grieved them just the same. Eventually, though, Sulpicio Lines was absolved of any blame by the Board of Marine Inquiry. According to reports, the investigation found that the operators of the vector had been the ones at fault. Apparently, the ship had been sailing without a license while manned by an inexperienced crew. Even worse, there had been no qualified master or lookout on board at the time of the collision. Even today, the sinking remains one of the worst maritime disasters to ever take place and the deadliest to occur during peacetime. Before that, the dubious record had been held by the SS Kianjia, a Chinese steamship that hit a mine and sank 50 miles south of Shanghai in 1948. Like that of the Doña Paz, the exact death toll remains unknown, although experts believe it could have been above 3,900. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe.